Okay, how's that? Awesome. Okay, great. So um, I am going to be talking about um, some joint work with Neymar Kani Hamed, Hadley Frost, Julio Salvatore, who are physicists, and Pierre Guy Pamondon, who's a representation theorist. And uh, there will be open problems. Um, in fact, usually when I talk about this project, I feel bad about how many things we still don't know. But given the nature of this conference, that's a feature. So um, uh, there, there, anyway, there are, there are lots of things we don't know. And we uh, would love to have help if you feel so inclined. Um, all right, so I'm going to begin um, with an example without telling you what it's an example of. And we'll just uh, see, uh, see how it goes from there. Um, so let's start off with an n-gon. Um, does someone raise the I mean, these ones? Yeah. Is that? Sorry. What's what's the what what's what's the word from the technical people? Is this a good idea? Okay. I. Okay. So. Um, so we're starting with an n gon, and um, I'm going to take L. L is going to be the set of laminates. So these are just uh, curves or homotopy classes of curves. Um, running from boundary to boundary. Um, and excluding um, either of these two things. So we don't want a curve that just enters and leaves again like that. And we don't want a curve that just cuts off a little corner like that. But so we, we want curves that look like that or like that, uh, like that. Um, so, um, um, well, so I've, I've, what I've defined is the set of laminates and then I'm about to define a relation on the set of laminates. Um, so for gamma and delta in my set L, um, I'm going to say that gamma um, sim delta, if or de I'm going to say gamma is compatible with delta, and I'm going to write it with a with a tilde, um, if uh, they can be drawn in a way that's non-crossing. Um, and I'm going to introduce some variables. So a variable u gamma for each gamma in L. And then I'm going to write down some crazy system of equations. So for each gamma, um, I'm going to write, consider this the, an equation u gamma plus the product over all the deltas that aren't compatible with gamma. Of u delta equals one. Um, so I, I, I look. I'm thinking about the set of all. Um, I mean, so so 
this is just cryptomorphic, the diagonals of a polygon. So I'm, I'm introducing, uh, it's just that I, I have chose to, to write it like this for uh, you know, a reason that will, um, it'll make my life easier later. But, but uh, so, so you know, this curve is equivalent to this curve. All that I need, all you need to remember about the curve is which diagonal did it start from and which diagonal did it end from? Well, yeah, sorry, which edge did it start from? Which edge did it end from? Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, please do interrupt if you have questions. Um, sorry, so the, 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 the individual laminates are these individual connected. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so that good, good point. These are connected. And then, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so. We now have the system of equations, one for each of the, you know, uh, laminates. Okay, so, um, and I'm going to write u for the solutions, and u sub greater than or equal to zero for the real non-negative solutions. Okay. So let's just stare at the system of equations and see what we're going to see in the real non-negative solutions. Well, if you look at this equation, you realize that both these terms are going to be non-negative. So each u gamma had better be between zero and one if it's actually going to be real and non-negative. So uh, we get zero is less than or equal to u gamma is less than or equal to one. And what happens if a u gamma goes to zero? Um, well, that means that this term is zero and we have a product of things that are between zero and one that has to equal one. So that means all the, the u deltas in this product have to be one. So everybody that's not compatible with gamma is forced to be one. So the u deltas that are left, they're still kind of in the game, are the ones that don't cross gamma. So, um, and the ones that and the ones that we've forgotten about are equal to one, so they're not making any difference. So what we wind up with is the same uh, system of u equations, but uh, or two kind of decoupled systems of u equations. One for the polygon on the left, one for the polygon on the right. Um, if we've split and we think of splitting it along the curve, yeah. Okay. So, um, in particular, um, the solutions um, with u gamma. If we, if we ask, what does it look like if all the u gammas are zero or one? Um, those look like the, the, we set uh, u gamma equals zero for a maximal non-crossing collection. And u gamma equals one for the others. Okay, so, um, and in fact, what turns out to happen is that U is an N minus three dimensional variety um, it's a partial complex it's a partial compactification. of m zero n. Um, so this is, um, so uh, Francis Brown uh, used these u's to, to think about the geometry of, uh, of this partial compactification um, and a reference for more stuff about this and from kind of the direction that, that I'm gonna be talking about 
is uh, a pair of papers, one by Arkani Hamed, um, uh, the Lamb and me, and one just by Arkani Hamed. Uh, and Lamb. Um, so, N is the number, N, N was, I had an N gone to begin with. Um, I never said that, I'm sorry. Um, aha, right, okay. Well, the number of strands in a maximal non-crossing configuration um, uh, is, is N minus three. I mean, we don't, we don't, uh, sorry, uh, sort of ignoring, ignoring uh, multiple, multiplicity. Uh, multiplicity doesn't play a role. Um, uh, so, so the number of different strands you can have is n minus three, because these things, these maximal non-crossing configurations, are really cryptomorphic to triangulations of the polygon. If you just, you know, if you just sort of think, well, I guess what I had here before was actually already um, such a triangulation. So you think about, uh, you know, instead of having, uh, you think about uh, kind of collapsing everybody who has an endpoint on this edge. To uh, to a to a vertex, and then uh, and then what you have is uh, is a triangulation, um, or it would have been a triangulation if I hadn't erased an edge. So let me put the edge back. So this this is actually a triangulation. Um, if you'd perhaps like it better if I drew it like that, Does that makes sense. Great. Okay. So, um, um, uh, moduli space of uh, endpoints um, I, uh, on a line. Um, yeah, sorry. This is this is this is. Uh, I'm I'm not going to say anything more about that. I just um, so um, what this amounts to, though, is that you the 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 uh, non-negative, totally non-negative part of U, this region where the, the U gammas are all non-negative, um, is a curvy realization of an associate hedron. Its boundaries are where an sum U gamma is zero. So those are those are the different uh, co-dimension one facets. And as I said, the vertices are are the triangulations. And so the combinatorics of this is the combinatorics of the associated. Okay. Now um, this next bit is is uh, one of the first open problems, or is I guess the first open problem, and is Something that I think, well, I think it might be an interesting open problem, even if you don't know anything about and don't care anything about and uh, any of the rest of what I'm talking about. It seems like it might be an interesting thing to me. So let me let me explain this this uh, question. So given any simplicial complex. Defined uh, whose faces are defined by pairwise compatibility. We could write down. The same equations. Right. So, so uh, compatible. No, no, no. I'm not generalizing. No, I'm, I'm generalizing. No, I'm just saying. No, I'm not. I'm not generalizing the the n gon. I'm generalizing the associahedron. So I'm saying I now have some ground set. The ground set are no longer curves on the n gon. 
They're just some ground set, and I have some notion of what it means for two guys in the ground set to be compatible or not compatible. Okay, so, um, so, so we have some ground set E and some notion of compatibility defined on it. And the faces are maximal compatible sets. Or sorry, faces are just uh, compatible sets. Hmm? Yes, clique complex. It's a clique complex. Exactly. Um, so we could we could write down the same system of equations. And that gives us some kind of geometry associated to a clique complex. And that seems like it might be an interesting thing to have. Um, the bad news is, well, so there's a piece of good news. The good news is um, the solutions with U gamma being zero and one do recover the complex. Um, uh, the, the, the recover the, the maximal phase, the maximal faces. I mean, for, for exactly the same reason that, that it worked for the, the non-crossing curves, it works here. The bad news is the dimension may be smaller. Um, and so let me just explain what happens. Well, so if you, if you look at the, hmm? smaller than the dimension of the simplicial complex. So that if you take the simplicial, so, so um, if you take the um, uh, simplicial complex, Um, which is a pentagon, it's um, dual um, polygon is a um, um, I, sorry, I guess I want it to be well, smaller. The dimension that I wanted to be is one more than that of the simplicial complex. So if you take a pentagon, then um, the compatibility on five, just uh, the compatibility relation on five points that's defined by these faces is exactly the compatibility on the five diagonals of uh, the five laminates in a pentagon. And so by what I just said, this works and you get a two-dimensional variety. If you take it, yes. This is a simplicial complex. It has five. It's a one-dimensional simplicial complex. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm just. I'm, yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. Sorry. There, there's. There's. There's too many pentagons. But so this is a one-dimensional simplicial complex on a, on five vertices. Um, this is another one-dimensional simplicial complex on five vertices. Um, and exercise. This also works and gives you a two dimensional variety. Hmm? Yes. I don't know what I said. <laughs> what did I say? Five. Okay. Yes. There are only four vertices in this square. <laughs> um, if you wanted, if you thought about the one dimensional simplicial complex that's a triangle, it's not clique. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of that's excluded from the get go. But if you think about the that simplicial comp that one dimensional simplicial complex, um, you get um, six lines plus some points. 
So this is very clearly not um, a wonderful uh, representation. So in these cases, you get this, this two-dimensional variety and the positive and the, the, the non-negative part gives you something that has the combinatorics of a pentagon and which is really has the combinatorics of a pentagon. Here you get something that has the combinatorics of a square. And here you get something that is kind of junk. Um, and so the question is, um, for what uh, clique complexes do you get um, a um, variety? Of complexes dimension D, variety of dimension D plus one. So, um, and I mean, it's not surprising that, that this kind of thing should happen, that we only are getting, you know, that we're getting something kind of, that we're not getting something of the dimension that we, we thought we were supposed to get. Because what did we start with? We started with. And we started with you know, a, a variable for each element of the ground set and an equation for each element of the ground set. So we had as many variables as equations. There's no real reason to expect that to go well as far as producing something higher dimensional. It's kind of a, it seems maybe, maybe it's a very special thing. Um, but, but it seems like an interesting thing to me. Um, and well, as we'll see, um, I do have some particular motivations in mind, which I will eventually get to. Oh gosh. Um, okay, so um, more generally, we could um, consider, we could define a compatibility degree. Um, or for uh, which is going to be a non negative integer uh, for gamma and delta in my ground set. Um, and such that the compatibility degree is positive if and only if uh, gamma is not compatible with delta. And then we could write down equations u gamma plus the product over delta of u delta to the power of the compatibility degree equals one. And everything works the same way. And this allows us to get some more nice examples. We can realize the hexagon this way. Um, that won't come as a total surprise to uh, cluster algebra people, but it turns out we can realize it in a clustery way and we can realize it also in a non-clustery way. And I'll mention the the non-clustery way um, um, when, I, when I get there. Um, so, um, oh, one other thing to, to just worth pointing out perhaps is that this, this allows me to include guys in the ground set that are not compatible with themselves. If you're not compatible with yourself, then you would show up in the term on the right, as well in, in your own equation, you would show up in the term on the right. And that would mean that you're a factor of the left-hand side, which is supposed to equal one. So that would mean you can't go to zero. So if you're not compatible with yourself, then you don't give a boundary. So this allows you to, to include sort of things that are combinatorially irrelevant, but depending on the circumstances, they might be, um, they might be relevant um, for whatever the setting is that you're starting from. And I will hopefully eventually get to tell you something about some of the settings that I have in mind. Okay, so, um, 
Okay, I think in view of time, I'm just going to say the clustery parenthesis out loud rather than writing it. There's another way to get the U equations, these equations here. Where might they have come from? Another place they can come from is the following thing. Um, you can take the, uni the, the cluster algebra of type A with universal coefficients um, and then specialize all the X's to one not just the x's from a single cluster which is a thing that we often do but actually require that all the cluster variables equal one if you do that that imposes conditions on the coefficients and these are the coefficient these are the conditions on the coefficients if the u the u gammas are these these coefficients from the universal cluster algebra the condition on the coefficients that says that i want all my x variables to equal one um, so these guys come from the source sink mutation exchange relations and so that gives you um th that gives you these equations anyway, so that that's another way to see where these come from um and it also motivates you if you're you're a clustery sort of person to think that you could you could do this for other finite type cluster algebras you can and that was also looked at in the paper that i already mentioned by nima and Songhe and thomas lamb Okay, so let me now get on to the motivation from physics. So um, this goes back to Koba and Nielsen in 1969. Um, and so they wanted to define something called the tree string amplitude or also known as the generalized Veneziano amplitude. And so what this looks like is you have n particles. And so, you're, so this is a scattering amplitude problem. You, you, want to, you want to describe what happens. You have these n particles that are going to interact somehow and zoom off. You want to know what happens. And um, you, know, you, you traditionally think of that in terms of Feynman diagrams. Um, so you have these n particles. Um, they're, their momenta are given by pi. Um, particles are massless, which means that so there's a, there's a um, symmetric bilinear form on the space of momenta for which the the individual momenta um, um, uh, you know have are, are null. But uh, we define x i j to be the sum of a bunch of consecutive momenta, pi, I, p, i plus one, um, p, j minus one, paired with itself. And um, then you want to define an integral, which is a function of these momenta. Um, And what they did was they said you should integrate over this region where the u's are positive of the product over gamma of u gamma to the power of x gamma. And of course, which reflects some measure which I don't want to talk about. So the, the point here is that if, um, if some x gamma goes to zero, then the effect of this is supposed to be that the uh that it produces a pole and its residue factorizes in a way that corresponds to cutting the surface along the curve gamma and um so so that's that's so that's 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 sort of where where this comes from um the and, and sort of in, in, in the background is the idea that this is, this is uh, these would normally be described by Feynman diagrams, which are being tree level Feynman diagrams, which you can draw on the disk that we started from. So it's part of the idea of perturbative quantum field theory that what you should expect to do is you would first write down something that corresponds to uh, Feynman diagrams that are in the shape of planar trees. But then 
you expect to add corrections, which correspond to final diagrams with loops. And those loops, or those final diagrams with loops, um, by sort of fattening slightly the, the edges of the final diagram, you see that you should be, you can think of them as being drawn on a surface that is not a disk, it's some surface of higher genus. And so the idea is that you should want to do something like this, but uh, associated to a curve, associated to a surface of higher genus. Um, so it was, it was understood back in 69 that, that you should want to do that. And they sort of, people tried to think about, you know, what happens if instead of um, starting with a disc, we start with an annulus um, and, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. But, you know, 50 years later, we have some more tools available um, and, you know, insights of uh, things like cluster algebras. And so, um, uh, so, so, so uh, that, that we're, we're attempting to, to uh, understand what the analog of that is. And so uh, another open problem, but one that we are busily trying to, to close is, uh, And I mean, this is a this is a, a physics problem, um, and I haven't explained enough, and I don't really understand enough of the physics to to really explain it uh, better. Uh, um, but that that is uh, that is as I said, where where the motivation uh, comes from. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm now going to really switch gears, and uh, those of you who, who know me will not be surprised that uh, the thing that is going to now make an appearance is finite dimensional algebras. Um, because it turns out that finite dimension, there's, a, there's a way to set up a system of U equations for a finite dimensional algebra, and we can solve the U equations for the finite dimensional algebra. Um, so. Um, so let A be a finite dimensional algebra. Um, and for convenience, I'm going to work over the complex numbers. Hmm? Non commutative. Well, uh, yeah, typically non commutative. I'm going to, um, we may assume um, of the form of a path algebra modulo an admissible ideal. Don't worry about what that means. Um, but uh, any finite dimensional algebra is equivalent to something of this form. So we, we can assume that, that that's what we're dealing with. Um, um, Q is a directed graph. So I'm going to probably call it a quiver. Um, and let's assume that its vertices are one to n. Then um, we're going to be interested in uh, the category of left A modules. And uh, a module M is called indecomposable if it can't be written as a direct sum of two smaller modules or of two non zero modules. Okay, so 
I'm going and these indecomposables, the indecomposable modules are going to be my ground set. And I'm going to define some new equations that way. And we will get back to, I eventually get back to the connection to surfaces and uh, the U equations that we, we already saw um, for the disk. So um, my ground set is going to be I. This is going to be the set of uh, M such that M is either an indecomposable module or um, an indecompos uh, shifted, indecomposable shifted projective. Don't worry about what that is uh, if, if that's not uh, familiar. So this is this is a um, so these this is n n is the the number of quiver number of vertices of my quiver. This is this, this provides some n kind of extra objects. Uh, people who are coming from cluster algebras will not be surprised that we might find ourselves with n kind of extra formal objects that we had to introduce. Um, if you're if you're unfamiliar, totally unfamiliar with the story, don't worry about it at all, and just think about the set of indecomposable modules. So, and for now, to begin with, I'm going to assume that I has only finitely many uh, objects in it. So we introduce um, um for m in my index set and variables. Uh, and equations U M plus the product over N in I of U N to the power of some compatibility degree, um, where that compatibility degree is the dimension of the morphism space from M to the outsider right and translation of n plus the dimension of palms from n to the outsider right and translation of m. And if the outsider right and translation is unfamiliar, it's just, um, you know, it, it, it takes a module, it gives you another module. Don't worry too much about it. Um, this is also what is known as the um, E invariant, um, I think with, with a slightly different choice of convention. and I'm not. I'm not necessarily in the same setting, but this is. But but uh, where both things make sense, this is the E invariant of Dirksen Weyman Zelovinsky. Um, and of course, I want my equation to be that U M plus this product is one. Okay. Yes. Uh, this this number. No. So that was that was the point of my comment over here that I can introduce some uh, I can make a I can introduce a compatibility degree that is not zero or one, um, and uh, and yeah one of the things that it, it allows me to do is to uh, to to encompass this this more general uh, situation. Um, right. So. Um, what I want to do is, is actually to tell you of a way to solve this system of equations in this generality. Um, so, but that requires that I introduce a couple of, of uh, kind of technical things about, well, not too technical, but a couple of things about modules. So um, given M a module, Um, the dimension vector of M is just, oh, right. Uh, so, so in, in my, my quiver has, so my path algebra contains um, lazy paths at each vertex, E1 up to EN, the sum of E1 up to EN equals the identity element of the algebra, EI squared equals EI. So these are these special uh, lazy paths. 
and uh, so we can we can think of and we can uh, decompose if, if you like to think of m as a representation then you can decompose it as uh, you, you're thinking of it as, as a collection of a vector space at each vertex of the quiver that's essentially what i'm doing by writing the dimension of m of uh, e1 times m this is just the same thing as the dimension of the vector space at vertex one the dimension of the vector space at vertex two and so forth the dimension of the vector space at vertex n so that's the dimension vector and there's a notion of f polynomial f sub m so this is a polynomial in n formal variables y1 to yn is defined to be the sum over all dimension vectors of the Euler characteristic of the quiver Grassmannian of d dimensional subspaces or d dimensional sub representations of M times y to the d. So um, y to the d means y1 to the d1, y2 to the d2, yn to the dn. And this is the uh, space of submodules of M of dimension D. So that's 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 a, um, a closed sub variety of the Grassmannian of D dimensional vector subspaces of M. I mean, M is in particular a vector space. I, I'm, I can, uh, well, so it, okay, it's, 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 it's a sub variety of a product of a Grassmannian of dimension uh, D, uh, D dimension D1 inside this vector space, dimension D2 inside this vector space, and so on. Okay, so in particular, uh, we're here with a complex number, so it has a really good Euler characteristic. And so this is some kind of generating function for the um, sub representations or sub modules of M. And um, it turns out to be closely related to, well, it turns out to be, yeah, very closely related to. Uh, by work of Dirksen, Raymond, Zelovinsky, closely related to the F polynomials in the sense of cluster algebras. Um, but um, in this setting, I'm not, I, there isn't necessarily a cluster algebra in the background anymore. I just have an arbitrary finite dimensional algebra. So um, then we have a theorem due to the, the team of us. Um, that we get an n dimensional family of solutions um, by setting u sub m equals y to the dim m, sorry, one minus y to the dim m over f sub m, f sub tau m, and u. For the shifted projective, it's just slightly different. It's one minus one over f um, I, at, at the injective at i, um, which is really the tau of the pi shifted by one. And pi shifted by one doesn't have an f polynomial. So really it looks, the denominator looks the same. The numerator arguably also looks the same because Pi shifted by one doesn't really have a dimension, so this just uh, disappears. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so this gives you an n-dimensional family of solutions since it's you know it's it's uh, uh, is rational functions in y one through y n. Um, the so but uh, so so a thing that we don't have the you know we hope but we don't know is and uh, so this is definitely open is um, are there other solutions in the example that we started with uh, coming from the disk 
the, the space cut out by the U equations was really a variety, just one irreducible component. But that's hard to, you know, uh, tell just from a bunch of equations whether that's true. Um, and so here we we parameterized a component, but we don't know that there there, there could be other components. Um, yes. The you no the user the user um, they're they're real uh, well they're 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 well they're complex and then we we can think about having them be these are just these are just this is just a family of this is just a system of equations over the complex numbers oh oh I see but but so so you're saying now once I've solved them like this well we can special we think about like setting y one through y n to be arbitrary you can you can specialize them to to complex numbers and then you you get complex numbers. Or you can specialize it to be real and you get real numbers. Oh, oh, I see. Yes. Okay, got you. Um, this. Um, it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, it's not obvious. Um, yeah, I think that is just totally not obvious. Um, Euler characteristics famously don't have to be positive, and uh, so yeah, a priori, I, and there are like obvious minus signs around. I, yeah, I, I don't. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I don't know. Um, um, I don't, at least at this instant, know how to answer it. Okay, so. Um, right, so um, for example, we can use this to get a curvy geometry that realizes the type A permutahedron. Um, by taking the quiver that looks like n vertices like this and arrows uh, going in both directions and relations where whenever we have an arrow going to the right and an arrow going to the left, both of those compositions are zero. So um, yeah, so, so, so uh, this, this is a, a finite dimensional algebra with only finitely many um, indecomposable representations. And this goes through and this produces some geometry um in this way okay it's not so easy to say because because i i mean because uh, you know yeah yeah un unfortunately that would be nice uh, but i don't uh um uh, i mean it's you, you know it, it's it's not uh, i mean it's not impossible to work it out and in, in fact i mean there's a com there's a combinatorial translation of it but i haven't worked out the combinatorics of it in particular, you don't get all the coefficients being one, um, and this is gives you a way another way to get the hexagon because the hexagon is uh, is of course the the, the a two permutahedron. So this gives you a way to get the the hexagon that's not the kind of clustery hexagon. Okay, well, um, so. Um, hmm. I have two sections remaining, but possibly only time to talk about one of them. Um, well, I think I will. Question in the chat. Does can somebody tell me what the question in the chat is? Or should I look at it? Question in the oh, audience. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Absolutely, yes. So, so that, yes, thank you. That's, 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 that's uh, exactly something. Ah, great, thank you, Vic. Um, so the question was, what if I would have just taken a type A quiver? Um, and of course, that's something that I should have said. Thank you very much for the question. Um, that gets us back to exactly the story of the disk. Um, and, and so, you know, the, yeah, so it, it recovers an associate Um And in fact, I'm, I'm about to explain a, general story about how algebras and surfaces match up and which which will in particular explain that uh, 
that uh, this this statement. So, um, okay. So, um, this uh, is based on work of Amio Plumaldo. Roll um, and Padrol, Palu, Pilo, uh, Plamondon. Anyway, there, there, and, and there's a number of other people who've been thinking about the connection between gentle algebras and surfaces. Um, I'm not going to try to list everybody. But so the idea is that from a surface with some kind of dissection, but I'm going to specialize it to a triangulation where it becomes easier. So I'm going to start off with an orientable surface with triangulation and corresponding to it, we get um, some, uh, some, there's some representation theory that's corresponding to it. Um, The representation theory of uh, what's called the gentle algebra. Um, and uh, basically, the maybe in the interest of time, let me um, just just uh, try to be a little quick and just say that open laminates on the surface. So without telling you really anything about what the about the algebra itself, um, the point is that the open laminates correspond to some indecomposable modules or shifted indecomposable projectives, and closed laminates. So these are um, homotopically non-trivial closed curves. Um, which I unwisely am denoting by two symbols that look very similar, uh, LO and LC. Um, those laminates correspond to C star families of indecomposable modules. And um, the, this gives you all the indecomposable modules. over a certain path algebra that comes from the triangulation. Um, so a triangulation T defines a gentle algebra um, the uh, vertices um, are arcs of the triangulation um, the edges, the, the arrows are um, well. So, so let me say it this way: If you have a triangulation, if you have a triangle in your triangulation, so each of those edges is supposed to correspond to a um, each of those edges corresponds to a vertex in the quiver, as I, I already said. So I have, I have a vertex for each of these guys. And then we add arrows going around clockwise. And then there's also some relations that the composition of any two successive arrows is zero. So that's the, that, that tells you what the algebra is. And then these are the, um, and then, so the modules correspond to the laminates. And so the point is that you could then write down um, the same U equations as before. And what you find, unfortunately, is that they don't work. Um, and so we were confused about that for a while. And uh, so let me tell you what,
Okay, let me just try to let me just write them down. Um, what i is infinite? Yes. So that is one of the points. Um, the other, the other thing, or another thing that's an issue is that, yeah, I mean, i is i is very infinite because we have um, actually a C star family. So to each closed curve, we actually have a whole C star family of modules. So if you just did the very naive thing, then you'd be trying to write down an equation where you have as many variables, like more variables than complex numbers. That doesn't seem very satisfying um, or safe. So um, what, what uh, we're going to do instead is we're going to notice that all of these modules that come from the same curve kind of look the same. Well, look, look very much the same. In particular, they all have the same F polynomial. So you should really just introduce one U gamma for them um, for, for, for the whole family. Um, but, well, okay. Um, well, so, so if gamma is, um, Question? Yes, that's also true. Um, you, you deal with the infinite product by saying, uh, by noticing that um, in this, uh, in you, in the, in the formula for UM, um, um equals one plus terms that are of uh, relatively high degree and so there's only finitely many terms there's only finitely many of the ums that are going to contribute to uh, any particular degree in the product so that's how you deal with that um the so um so if gamma is in the open laminates then the equation just turns out to be um uh, the product over the guys all you see are the guys that are also in the that are also open laminates and if gamma is in a closed laminate then what you see is the guys in open laminates together with um, um, things that are just multiples of delta Um, and so this is this is um, let me not really explain what that means. Uh, these are these are just curves that you know you, instead of having delta, you might take a multiple of delta. And if delta was already a curve that went that wrapped around itself several times, then you can take a fractional multiple of delta as well. Uh, sorry, I meant of gamma here. Um, so um, anyway, so so these look kind of peculiar. But there is, and but we can show that there are solutions to these as formal power series. Exactly the same solutions work. Um, again, we have the question: Are they um, all the solutions or not? And we don't know. Um, the so so I realize that I'm out of time. Um, the the uh, remaining thing that I would have liked to have said is. Um, to really ask the question that is for us entirely open, and I think really I, I'm, I'm excited about is uh, what happens if you have an arbitrary finite dimensional algebra. It turns out that there's a reasonable thing you can do to write down equations, which in the general case specialize to give you this. Um, and so that's, uh, but in, in the, in, but in that totally general case, um, we don't know that they're solved by the, uh, the same solutions. Um, so I think that was what I wanted to tell you mostly. Thank you very much. Go ahead.
Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, oh yes, yes, thank you, Vic. Um, so so Alan asked, could you upgrade the Euler characteristics to some kind of Frank array polynomial? Um, and the so and um, I've thought some about that. It seems like what you would want to do in that case would be to have uh, to be working with um, you know uh, your u variable is probably not commuting any longer, so you should they should probably be non commutative, um, and they should in the uh, but I mean so so. I mean, because, well, at least to me, what you're suge saying suggests something like working with quantum cluster algebras. Um, but, and, and so, so yeah, things would be not commuting and so forth. Um, the discouraging thing about that uh, is that, or the thing that, that made me, you know, kind of unconvinced that I should do that is that if you set that, if you remember, one of the ways to get this space is to say, I'm going to insist that all my cluster variables equal one. Um, and if I insist that, then um, then they obviously are commuting with each other because they're all equal to one. And also the the u's we should really think of them as being coefficients. And so the coefficients always should be q commuting with each other. And so it, it somehow I, I can't anyway I, I can't I can't make everything I, I can't I can't figure out how to do that. But I I would love to do that. And if you have or anybody has suggestions about how one might try to do that that would be different from what i was thinking i'm certainly interested Pasha. yes um yes so so pasha asked what about other equations that the use satisfy and yes there are a whole bunch of other equations that the use satisfy um the um in the surface in the general surface case you can, one of the ways to think about the surface case is to sort of think about lifting it to a universal cover. And so you see lots of these, these U equations that you're asking about, these other more general U equations also appear um, as a result. Um, there's other ways to think about where the U equations are coming from. From a clustery point of view, I, the U equations, as I said, come from source sync mutations, but you have other mutations. Those also give you valid U equations. Um, in that finite type cluster setting, but so anyway, there's lots of sources of U equations. Okay. Yeah, Pasha. And one more. So, do we retain connections to universal coefficients on other surfaces? I haven't. Yeah, I I don't. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Pasha asked about, you know, how much of a connection do we still have to universal coefficients um, in, uh, you know, for other surfaces? That's a, that's a good question. I don't think we've thought too much about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, Alex. Um, I don't, so right, thank you, Vic, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Alex asked if there were um, algebras that are associated to like graph associahedra. Um, and I don't, I don't know a general, anything general like that. I mean, of course you can, I mean, some of them, I mean, cyclohedra do come up also in, in this setting, but I don't know of any general procedure. Other questions? Anything in the chat? Oh, okay, great. Oh. Uh. Uh, whatever you like, Nathan. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. So I'm, I'm just curious what happens in the algebra in, in, you know, when you start with general finite dimensional algebra, um, and you um, and you pass to a quotient of it. I mean, for example, there's this permutahedron to a sociahedron story, going from pre-projective to, you know, to 
to just an ordinary quiver. So is, is there is there something nice that happens with these algebras when you do something like that and change your that happens with these systems of equation, I should say, when you change your algebra by just adding more relations and passing to a quotient. Yeah, th thank you. That yes. So the answer is yes. Um, so I mean, to, to go from the the preprojective algebra to the uh, to the, the the path algebra, you know, you can just quotient by the uh, half the arrows, right? Um, and and now you have just a, a path algebra. And yes, so there is a quotient from the space of from 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 there, there's a there's a a map of varieties from the uh, upstairs space to the downstairs space so there's some kind of there's some there's some corresponding map between the geometric varieties uh, at least the component in each case that we understand so i can't say anything about the other components because that might not be there because i don't know anything about them but for the component that we understand um we can describe that uh precisely thank you any other questions if not uh let's thank you again